Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question. WTF is Necropolis, a diabolical dungeon delve. This is brought to you by Hairbrain Schemes, the fellows behind Shadowrun, as well as the forthcoming Battletech game, which I dearly hope will be good, because good lord, we have been waiting a while for one of those. In the meantime, however, we get this, a procedurally generated third-person action dungeon crawl, which is going to certainly set off the soul's bells in the heads of a lot of people. I don't necessarily think that that is a fair comparison, but when you have relatively slow combat, quite a lot of difficulty, and a dark aesthetic, especially from third person, people do tend to make associations like that. I'd actually describe it more as Zelda more so than anything else, but of course based in a procedurally generated world. Question is, is it any good? I had a look at a preview version of this at PAX, and I enjoyed what I saw, but it certainly needed a lot of work. Has it got to that point? Well, that is a great question, I can tell you. First, let's dive into the options menu. So, a glaring omission, before we look at anything, is the fact that you cannot rebind the keys. Now, you can use controller or mouse and keyboard. I personally would use a controller, and the reason for that is there are some fairly wonky and awkward key combinations. For instance, using shift with the right click for a second and secondary attack. Whereas, with the controller, you have a separate button for that. Same with the heavy attack on the main mouse button there as well. Shift for heavy attack and then a hold. It's better, in my opinion, to have a separate button for that. They could have very easily done that, but since you can't rebind any of the keys, well, you can't. So, that's a little annoying. I decided to stick with the controller as a result of that. Outside of that, you have look sensitivity and the ability to, and this is quite important, uh, set privacy because this game is actually a co-op game. You'll notice available slots up at the top there. Currently nobody's playing it because it's not actually out. It certainly will be by the time this video releases. And if we head on over to the audio settings, you've got separate sliders for SFX music and master, which is always nice. And video, anti-aliasing, don't know what kind of anti-aliasing. And then down here, you've got a bunch more stuff. You can up the resolution scale to make it look even better, render at a higher res, all that sort of thing. That's always nice. Nothing too obvious that's missing here, as far as I can tell. I don't know where anastrotropic filtering ran off to, or whether it's hiding under another one of these terms, but it's not exactly a game where graphical prowess is all that important. Outside of that, resolution options, full screen on or off. There is no borderless window mode, just bear that in mind. So if you're looking for that setting, you will be missing it. Okay, so let's continue the game and we'll talk a little bit about this particular title, where it succeeds and where it fails. So I feel after playing a good, let's see, six or so hours of the game, at least two of those were in co-op, I'm feeling like it needed quite a bit more time in the oven. As you can kind of see right there, what is this activated loaded stuff? Who knows? The game unfortunately has uh, quite a few bugs related to it. So welcome to Necropolis, and as you can see, I am a generic adventurer. I do really like the art style of it, I've got to say. It's a, using a technique that I believe is called Fong Shading. So everything's very flat. And I think it's very stylistically interesting. I personally like the way the main character looks, I like the way this weapon looks, I like the emphasis on lighting. Unfortunately, there are a couple of issues with it that you might not necessarily notice at first glance. The fact that everything is flat shaded means it's very difficult to differentiate between the different rooms. And as a result, navigation in this game can be an absolute pain in the ass. It doesn't have a minimap, and of course, it has procedurally generated levels. You notice a frame drop there. That does happen every once in a while, unfortunately. Hello. What ends up happening is you've got these procedurally generated rooms that all look identical, which means that it's really easy to get turned around. I mean, I, I am very, very aware that I'm not that great at navigation. That's certainly not one of my skills. But when you have a bunch of corridors that all have this same shade of gray, it can be very difficult to figure out where you went. Oh dear, this is a bug that I have not seen before. You notice that the... It seems that the enemies have spawned with a, a sort of placeholder indicator, which is not exactly ideal. We have a, another big frame drop there as well. Man, having far more problems this time around than I was having with the game initially, but it's not like I haven't seen bugs with it before. Bear in mind, yeah, this is the review version, as it were. This is the version that everyone is going to be getting when this game launches, which I believe has already happened. So, not ideal. 
Not really sure why it's doing any of those things. That is not a bug I have seen before. It's giving me a nice little warning as to upcoming enemies and such, but... Ugh, I... You know what, I'm gonna restart the game because this is gonna be obnoxious as hell to look at, so let's give that a shot. Well, I did figure out what the problem was. It turns out that F10 is a debug mode, <laughs> and F10 is also the button that I use for my capture software. So I changed that, and that turned the big green glowing spheres off, which is nice. Uh, a bit unfortunate to leave that in this version. I hope that is not in the release version, because that is quite literally a cheat. <laughs> I had no idea. Well, there you go. You learn something new every day. In fact, F9 also had something. You can see it up to the top left there, but that doesn't seem to be interfering with the gameplay, so I can leave that on. So, you know, it's not the world's most technically advanced game in terms of its aesthetic. I, again, do like it, but it causes problems. Like, it has real in-game consequences. You know, all of these corridors look the same, and unless you use chalk, which is an item in the game that you can craft, which marks where you've been, it can be difficult to remember. And unfortunately, chalk costs resources, and some of those resources don't drop all that reliably. Bloody hell! So, another problem the game has is the sodding camera. It can become a real issue from time to time. It is entirely possible for you to run into a situation where the camera gets stuck on terrain, and you end up just getting absolutely smashed by a large group of enemies. There doesn't seem to be a limit as to how many enemies can actually fight you at any given time, and you don't seem to stagger back or have any real inv invincibility frames. So, it's possible to lose a lot of your health really, really quickly. Now, you regenerate your health using food, which can be crafted relatively easily. You know, the materials for that do drop quite often, and as much as I would love to show you the crafting, the game doesn't pause when you're doing any of that, so you can actually get killed while you have your crafting menu up, or the menu screen, or anything along those lines, which I don't really like. I believe that's there because the game is primarily, I believe, designed to be played in co-op multiplayer, so pause wouldn't be a thing there, but of course it does have a single player mode, so you'd think they'd add that in. I don't really see the benefit of not doing that. You can craft various potions and all sorts of things like that. Now, usually you'd have to find most of the resources and recipes to make these, but I actually have what's called a codex with me, which gives me a bunch of recipes from the start. Now, the codex is the only real form of progression that I've noticed so far in this game, and codexes allow you to start each game, bearing in mind that once you die, you lose your character and have to start from the beginning with a specific ability. Now, you acquire these codexes through tokens of favor, which you can get by killing monsters, by getting a lot of gems, and by completing the various objectives that the so-called Brazen Head gives you, which is this sort of godlike figure at the start of each level that will make various quips and so on and so forth. He'll give you three sub-objectives every level to complete, and each time you complete one of those, you will get a token of favor. The codexes vary in cost, and the codexes also appear to have a tier system attached to them, which means that perhaps you might be able to get better versions of them, but I don't know how you would do that. You don't get it through buying them. If they are available, they're available much later in the game in a part that I have not got to. And unfortunately, of course, getting to... I don't know why I missed him there. I have a really long swing. I don't know if that attack is a counter of some sort, but it seems like I'm missing him a lot. Oh god, this guy's gonna explode, isn't he? Why? No. Why would he do that? The problem with a game that has permadeath is that progressing far in it, of course, is very tricky, because you lose your progress every time you die. So I feel that it makes critiquing or reviewing a game like this much, much more difficult especially when a game like this is designed intentionally to be challenging. Not to mention the fact, as I said before, that this game is really designed to be played in co-op, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Ah, so, the progression is done through these codexes, and that seems to be the only way that it's done. Which, to me, is not brilliant. Most roguelite games, as they describe themselves, have some form of progression so that you feel like every run gets you somewhere. Now, they, that does exist in this game, it just doesn't exist in a particularly compelling way, as far as I'm concerned. You can only equip one codex at once, and it seems like once you've found the one for your preferred playstyle, there'd really be no reason to buy any others. The only other things you can get are dyes, which are entirely cosmetic. If the game does have unlockable classes, then it has not made that clear. 
And as a direct result, when you play this game, certainly in these six hours, the only thing that I ever get is a class with a basic sword and a basic buckler, which are both tier zero weapons. You may have noticed that weapons are dropping on the ground here. And these weapons are designated by tier, but they don't really tell you all that much else about them, other than a little bit of flavor text. So if I were to pick up the Hordeman Axe, for instance, then I go to the inventory and I have a look at that axe, then it's not going to tell me how much damage it does. It's not going to tell me how fast it is. Basically, that's something you've kind of got to learn for yourself. Now, this level of obfuscation is something that a lot of roguelike games do. And some people really enjoy that element of mystery. I am not one of them. It's what I like to... Oh, sod off. It's what I like to call... Wifficulty. And that's wiki difficulty. Basically, it's an artificial form of difficulty derived from obfuscating key pieces of information. And a lot of roguelike games do that, and generally speaking, that illusion of difficulty evaporates once there's a wiki up that you can just look up all the information on. This is a game that definitely has that. You've got different potions which do different things, but you don't really know what they do until you take them. You can get mystery potions. This at least gives you some information. Some potions are pretty nice in terms of the information they give you, and some really lack that info. But it's the weapons and equipment that really lack that key information, as well as the code codices. And the codices are the ones I have the real problem with, because you have to spend tokens of favor to get them, and the acquisition of tokens of favor can take hours. So if you buy the wrong codex, well, you can't sell it back, as far as I'm aware, and you can end up completely wasting your time and progress to get something that is really not actually that useful. The first codex that I got, I still don't know what it even does. It's a, some sort of berserk codex, but I haven't noticed any difference in my attacks or anything like that. Was there any need to obfuscate that information? I don't think so. I think there's a big difference between little mystery events and elements in a game versus just obfuscating key information, and I really think that this game obfuscates key information for no good reason which I'm not a big fan of. Now, let's talk a little bit about the combat, because, of course, the combat is a pretty key part of this game. It's going to be the vast majority of what you're doing. Hello. I'm going to... Hmm, what shall I buy from him? Get Buy a bunch of potions of vigor, I think. There we go. A lot of these uh, potions really kind of do the same thing. They usually just uh, regenerate health and stamina, and this is sort of relevant to the combat discussion. So... You have a light, a set of light attacks, and you also have a heavy attack and a charged attack. Now, the charged attack will take up stamina on a permanent basis. You'll notice that stamina bar down the bottom there, the blue bar, actually starts to reserve elements of it as you go forward. And that's as your character gets more and more exhausted. And generally speaking, you get exhausted through doing shield bashes, which you can do like that and also through doing power attacks. Your regular attacks don't consume stamina, that at least they don't consume permanent stamina. You know, the stamina can be regenerated. It has a stamina system very similar to Dark Souls, so you can't keep spamming away and rolling all the time and blocking reliably. But the reserved stamina system is for those power moves. And the power moves are very, very strong, so you'll want to use them. You can clear out an entire group of enemies with them, so you want to use them sparingly, but they are definitely very, very useful indeed. Now, the stamina is regenerated by eating food. The food is generally crafted or found. You can also drink various potions. If you get an unidentified potion, it could be a bad thing. It could be a good thing. Right now, I have an, a magic scroll of some sort. I don't know what it does. I could cast it in the middle of combat, and it could blow me up. Who knows? It, it could do that. Do I find that a particularly enjoyable element? I mean, there's a little bit of risk-reward involved in that. I don't hate that too much, as much as I hate the obfuscation of key information. I think that, you know, this isn't really too bad. But some people are going to object to that. It's like, well, why? This is unnecessary. You know, why Why does the game have this much obfuscation? Why is it supposedly trying to screw you over on purpose? A little bit excessive. Now, in terms of the way that the combat handles, some people are going to get a little bit of a Souls vibe from it, but it's nowhere near as polished. The attacks don't have as much weight. The animation quality isn't anywhere near as good. The hitboxes don't seem to be anywhere near as accurate. 
the way that the enemies telegraph. Uh, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. It varies from enemy to enemy, but what I will say is that most of the enemies that don't telegraph that much don't really hit you that hard. So that tends to mitigate the fact that you can't necessarily see their attacks coming. And that I will, and I'll also say that the block is very, very reliable as well. So, you know, it, it's not a huge deal that you see all these enemies that don't really telegraph that much because you have this block that can very easily block all of their damage coming in as long as you've got stamina. So that mitigates that complaint quite a little bit. But if you're looking for really impactful combat, you're not really going to find that here. A lot of it comes down to fairly poor feedback in terms of your weapon's impact. You know, you don't generally see the enemy staggering all that much. Sometimes you can knock them down on the ground, but it's mostly just a little red flash, and it can be difficult to stagger an enemy without using your shield. Oh, bloody hell. Speaking of shield, I need to block this guy. The best way to make them stagger is to shield bash them, which can, you know, that can take a little bit of learning to do because I think that a lot of people are not going to be used to that sort of style of combat. They're just going to be like, block, 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 hit. Well, actually, shield bash is really key to your success, so I'd strongly make, recommend that you do it quite a lot. But the audio assets are fairly anemic when you actually hit an enemy, which can mean that the player feedback in the combat is nowhere near as satisfying as it otherwise could be. There is also a, a fairly reliable dodge that will interrupt any attack that you're doing, so you can do that as well. You've got, you've got plenty of means to avoid damage most of the time. There are definitely situations where the camera can go out of control or where a giant um, wave of enemies can kind of spawn around you and just surround you and knock you into a corner. And since you don't have those in invincibility frames, you can often just get wailed on and you can get wailed on multiple times before you really have any chance to recover. That can be a problem, especially when you're dealing with a game where once you die, you're dead for good. That can be very frustrating. One mistake can lead to a waste of your run. And these levels can drag on for a while. It really depends on how it generates the level. Sometimes you can get through the level very quickly. Sometimes it can take forever. And you are encouraged to explore everywhere because the more gems you get, the more they are converted to tokens of favor at the end. Not to mention the very... Uh, why are there six of these? Bloody hell! That is a lot of dudes. All right, I'm going to get out this magic scroll and hope that it does the job. Please do something good. I drained the life essence. That didn't really do much. So many enemies and so difficult to actually stagger all of them. Bloody hell. God. And they just spawned out of nowhere as well, which it was pretty obnoxious. They've got shields, which makes matters even worse. <laughs> oh, please go away. Good lord. Hey, yeah, no, it's not polished Souls-like combat. I think there's quite a few problems with it, and it is certainly going to frustrate a great deal of people, especially with that permadeath aspect. Now, let me talk about the permadeath aspect, because I was talking, I was speaking earlier to the aspect of co-op within this game. And I said, this game was obviously designed to be played in co-op. Now, what do I mean by that? Well... Here's the thing, when you're playing co-op, this one death and you're done thing is not a factor. Because as long as even one of your party members lives, they can resurrect you effectively for free. You can actually cheese it as well. If you're on really low HP, you can actually hit your friend, kill him because it has friendly fire, because of course it does, and then resurrect them for half health and there's basically no penalty whatsoever to that outside of a little bit of stamina loss which can very easily be generated through the food that you can very readily craft almost all the time. I am a little confused as to the design philosophy of this game, because if you play this game in single player, it's punishingly difficult, simply because of the fact that it's one death and you're done. You play it in co-op, it's much, much, much easier. There seems to be a very weird inconsistency in terms of the game's design philosophy. Like, half of it is saying, well, we want to make a really, really difficult game, or once you're dead, you're done. And you've got to be super careful. And the other half of it's saying, well, if you're playing co-op, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. I know to some degree that's the case in Dark Souls as well, but... Dark Souls has checkpoints. Dark Souls has reliable levels. Dark Souls has predictable bosses and enemies. And in terms of its spawns, it always spawns the same number of enemies at any given time. You know, it's handcrafted. So I think that... When you create a difficult game that's handcrafted that you can learn, it's much more acceptable than creating a, a game which randomly generates a lot of its stuff, and some of it can be perceived as unfair. Now, the game is 
because of that ability to resurrect a lot more fun in co-op, I have to admit. And there's certain things you have to bear in mind in co-op as well, like hitting your enemies with, uh, hitting your friends with large swings. That, that I found quite interesting. When I was actually on Skype with a few friends that also had pre-release copies of this, we were having a pretty good time with it because I had this giant spear and the my friends were having to keep out of the way and it's like all right i'll go in with the spear and do my big swing combo and then i'll back off so i can regenerate my stamina and you can go in and finish them off you know it was actually quite strategic that's not really the case when playing in single player though you know obviously if you wail away and burn all your stamina then you can certainly die but i think that the co-op mode is where the game shines i don't think that makes the game a great game though for one it's buggy there are enemies that get stuck on terrain on a very frequent basis. I've had the game actually literally slow down for no apparent reason. That required a game restart, like all the animations were much slower, even though the frame rate was totally fine. I have no explanation as to why it did that. The game has occasional stutters and freezes, which are not particularly good, especially when it's not exactly an advanced looking title. I presume it's probably generating elements of the level, but it's not nice to get that, especially in the middle of combat. That can actually kill you. <coughs> Also, we've had levels that actually allowed us to fall through the world. <laughs> we found the the edge of the level, like a hole in the level's geometry, and we went through it, assuming it was maybe a secret room or something, and then we fell forever. <laughs> Which wasn't brilliant. You know, that was an interesting experience in co-op, to say the least. And we had to actually restart the whole thing in order to fix it, which, again, wasn't ideal. Oh. That was quick. Well... I just lost like 25, 30 minutes of progress. <laughs> at least we get some tokens of favor at the end of it. My new total of tokens of favor is 11, which is one below what I actually... Oh, no, it's 13. There we go. I can actually buy the codex that I want to now. Well, you've experienced death. You know, edit character just really lets you change the color of it, which is not particularly great. I'll choose between a male and female. There's a lack of classes and just general variety, I think, in terms of weapons and abilities, which is not particularly attractive. I mean, I would like to say that I've enjoyed my time with Necropolis, but for the most part, I haven't. I have enjoyed the time in co-op, but I, if you were to ask me to recommend this game for a single-player experience, I wouldn't. Now, it's very, very easy to die very suddenly from either a pack of enemies just hitting you repeatedly, or from an enemy like that just sort of pulling off a combo that you didn't expect, which will wipe you out completely. And yeah, I get it, you can learn what those enemies do, but, you know, in Dark Souls, I don't have to restart the whole damn game every time I have to learn from my mistakes. And I'm getting a little bit tired of games that do that for seemingly no reason. I don't feel the procedural generation is actually much of a selling point anymore. I would prefer handcrafted levels for the most part, well-designed levels, and most of these games don't really have well-designed levels. They have levels which are generated through an algorithm, and most of them end up being fairly generic, fairly similar. I have to ask, what is the benefit to gamers when it comes to procedural generation? Because the marketing spiel is, well, you get a different level every time, but do you really? If you're facing the same enemies every time, if you're encountering the same limited number of events every time, if you're seeing the exact same terrain every time, Really, how different is that? In my eyes, actually, I think that that's quite a lot of FUD. I, I think that it's a, it's a big excuse. I don't really feel that it is a great system for gamers. I'm gonna buy car paper damn. Lord knows what that does. I think it gives me more money, but who knows if that's true. Ugh. I don't think it's a great system for gamers. I don't think it's all that beneficial. Can I even differentiate between level 1 in this game every time I've died? You know, I've played through level 1, what, 11 or 12 times? It's always the same kind of terrain. It's always the same sort of enemies. I, I would kind of prefer to be playing through the same sort of levels over and over again so I can navigate through them quicker to get to the new content. You know, and th that's what a game like this really has a problem with. You're playing the same content over and over again in order to get to new content, but you're being consistently held back by the fact that you have this permadeath aspect, whereas a lot of games that are difficult don't have that permadeath aspect. And other roguelites can kind of get around it by just having more interesting progression overall. 
and also having, you know, really great combat or whatever, and a lot of uh, weapon variety. Yeah, for instance, Enter the Gungeon. You know, there's so much weapon variety in that game that every run does feel a little bit different, and while this game claims to have over 100 weapon sets, you're not going to see the vast majority of them till later on unless you get very, very lucky with a chest drop. So you're going to be using the same sort of weapons over and over again. Now, there can be an argument in favor of having mobs always drop the same weapons because you can reliably pick up a weapon that suits your particular combat style every time you have to start a new run. However, I don't think that's a good enough excuse. I don't think that's a good enough replacement for having a lot of weapon and combat variety early on in the game. You know, I'm willing to play level one of Enter the Gungeon multiple times because who knows what I'm going to get out of that chest. And the chances are I'm also unlocking a bunch of different weapons for my next run. I'm not getting that here. You know, the, the progress I'm getting is is these codices, which are really not that interesting. You know, they're passive equipment bonuses. That's, that's not really all that enjoyable. I'm getting a ton of money here, as you can probably notice, and I imagine that is from my codex, and that's great. You know, I could buy a bunch of potions. I can, if I find a vendor, I can maybe buy a better tier weapon for that run, but if I just die, I'm going to lose it anyway. I, I think that Necropolis could have used an awful lot more time in the oven. The version that I played at PAX does not feel all that different at all to the version that I'm playing right now. I'm not finding my single-player dungeon delving experience to be all that interesting. I'm finding the co-op certainly to be far more enjoyable than the single-player. And if you are going to pick this up, then do make sure you've got a few friends to pick it up with. Although there is a, a somewhat of a caveat with that. When you host the game and you're mid-game with a character, you as the host have your character saved. So you can come back with your equipment and everything, assuming you didn't die. But the people that joined you didn't. Now, they can come back into your game and they can get the same character, but if they decide, oh, I want to play my character that got these tier 2 weapons in my friends run in, a, in single player, well, you actually, actually can't do that. You do keep your tokens of favor and your codex progression, but you don't keep your per run character progression. So you need to bear that in mind when playing it in co-op. One other thing to bear in mind is the price point. I mean, this game is coming out at $30, and I'm not 100% convinced by that. Sure, it, you know, it is a full 3D game, and it does have multiplayer, which a lot of these roguelike games don't, but you're also competing in a market where something like Isaac is more like $10 to $15 cheaper on sale, and things like Gungeon are more like $15 to $20. This is quite a, it's quite a lot of money for something that I don't actually feel is all that polished, unfortunately. I say the combat is fairly average. The exploration isn't that enjoyable because there's really not all that much to find. The levels are very, very similar. And, of course, the combat does suffer every now and again from what I would call unfairness, which would be acceptable if you didn't have to start the whole bloody thing again when you die. Uh, I'm not really convinced by this right now. Uh, to me, this, unless you are picking this up for a co-op dungeon delve experience, which, you know, to their credit, is what they advertised it as, this is a wait and see for me. I think that this, this is a game that could have maybe benefited from early access. This is a game that feels like it probably is still in early access. And I think that maybe six months down the line, we're going to hopefully see some very interesting development with it and... We're going to see, hopefully, class variety and better weapon variety and better balanced early levels and maybe some sort of checkpoint system. Assuming that they don't think that they are completely stuck in that design philosophy, which, if you look at the way that co-op is set up, I really don't think they are. And if they claim otherwise, I have to ask, well, why do you let people res each other in co-op then? If you don't let them do that in single player, if you're claiming it's a permadeath game. It obviously isn't. If you liked what you saw here and you're willing to tolerate playing the same content over and over again because you got killed, then cool, you have a lot more patience than I do. I think it's pretty well known at this point. I don't have a lot of patience for games that do that these days. But I'll probably play a little bit more of this with my friends in co-op because it certainly was a hell of a lot more fun like that. But I'm not going to be playing any more of it in single player, nor can I really recommend the game as a single player experience, unfortunately. It's quite ambitious in terms of its scope. To procedurally generate a full 3D world like this that looks like this and feels like this is, uh, you know, it's fairly ambitious. I've got to applaud them for that. I just don't think that the execution is there necessarily. And I'm hoping that 
within the next six or six months or maybe a year of content development that the game is fully fleshed out because it does feel somewhat bare bones right now, not to mention a little bit unfair at times. Necropolis, ladies and gentlemen, available for $30 or your regional equivalent on Steam. My name has been Topol Biscuit. Thank you uh, very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, by all means, do feel free to click the like button. If you did not, the dislike button is right over there. And I'll see you next time.